So looks like I'm recording. Um, <clears throat> so our first speaker is River Beard from uh, Bethel University, and he will be talking about a portable atomic frequency standard. So um, I'm going to mute and River, why don't you share your screen and we'll get started. All right, um, can you all hear and see me okay? All right, thank you. Um, I'm River Beard from Bethel University. Uh, welcome to my talk. I'll be talking about uh, our work here, working on a two photon frequency standard using atomic rubidium. Uh, so I guess to, to start off with what is a frequency standard, it's essentially an, an oscillator of reliable, stable frequency, and it gets used as the ticking mechanism for a very high precision clock. Our goal here is for, well, what we're working towards is an optical atomic clock. The optical basically means that the ticking mechanism uh, is a laser beam, and atomic means that the frequency of our laser beam is locked to an atomic transition. In other words, the difference in energy levels um, in a, in a given atomic structure. These do exist. Uh, some of the most precise atomic clocks use laser cooling um, and trapping atoms to try to prevent the atoms from moving to avoid a Doppler shift. Uh, in other words, to make sure that the frequency that the atom C in the laser beam is the same frequency that the laser beam believes it's generating um, to keep those reference frames the same. Uh, I'll talk about that more in a second. Some of the requirements that we're trying to meet is to keep this clock compact, um, basically small and low energy requirements. We want to be able to put this on satellites to basically replace the current GPS uh, satellite clocks. The biggest way that we're going to achieve this is using a two photon transition. So. Most atomic clocks use a one photon transition. Basically what this means is that the energy difference, the, the difference in energy levels between the ground state and excited state that you're bringing the atoms to is the energy of one photon in your laser beam. The energy of a photon is proportional to the frequency. So that, that means that you can carefully monitor the frequency of your laser beam using the atoms. Um, in order to avoid the Doppler shift, we're, we're actually using two photons. So we're sending the laser beam through our uh, atomic sample and then bouncing it off of a mirror. And the idea is that the atoms absorb one photon from each direction. And if you ignore relativistic effects, this will cancel out the Doppler shift. The one is red shifted by the same amount. The other is blue shifted. So you might ask, why, why would you bother using atoms? Why wouldn't you just have a laser as your, as your oscillator? So lasers are generally tunable. We're using an external cavity diode laser. Uh, the reason that we're using atoms is you don't, there's no specs for manufacturing. They already exist. They're, they're some of the, the simplest pieces in nature. So if you have an atomic species, they're all the atoms in the universe, as far as we know, uh, are the same, so of, of that species. So we're using natural rubidium. That means that we have both rubidium-87 um, and rubidium-85 for our isotopes. Atoms have very discrete energy levels. So they're basically what that means is they're picky about how much energy they will absorb at a given time, which is what we want, because we're also trying to be picky about exactly what frequency we can keep our laser beam at. So on the left, we basically have a, let's, uh, okay, here we go, sorry about that. On the left, we basically have a schematic of the, the, the spectrum of rubidium uh, around the two photon 5s to 5d transition. Um, and then we have an, an energy level diagram on the, the right hand side. So this is a schematic of 
our experimental setup. We're starting at the left and then traveling to the right, bouncing off the mirror and going back to the left. So starting at the left, we have our laser beam. It's at about 778 nanometers. Uh, we shine it through a cell of rubidium vapor that we're keeping at 100 degrees Celsius. This is mostly just to make sure that the vapor is well populated with these atoms so we can get a detectable signal. And then we use a mirror to retroreflect the beam back through on the same path that it began with so that we have those, those counter propagating laser beams of the same frequency, well, same frequency in our reference frame, but the same total frequency in any reference frame that is not relativistic, which we're not too concerned about. Uh, we're using an electric heating element to keep the atoms at 100 degrees Celsius. There are other ways to do this, but it requires more space. So we want to see if we can get away with using an electric heating element. And then of course, to protect the atoms from the Earth's magnetic field to avoid Zeeman splitting, we are using Helmholtz coils in one direction and then some other coils in the other two directions to basically we can tune those to cancel out the Earth's magnetic field. The sensor that we're using to detect atomic fluorescence, if we see fluorescence, we know that our laser beam is at the right frequency. So the sensor that we're using to detect fluorescence is something called a photomultiplier tube. It's, it's basically just a very sensitive uh, detector. These are just some photos of the lab equipment uh, we're working with. We have our interrogating laser on the left, um, our vapor cell next to that, and then we have our coils, our Helmholtz coils along the optical axis, and then a few other coils on the other side. And we have our photomultiplier tube. There's a few other components, but these are, these are just the main ones. So a lot of the work that we did over the summer, or a lot of the, the fruitful part of the work we did over the summer was in and basically analyzing the spectra, the absorptive spectra of these atoms under varying environmental conditions. Um, roughly speaking, this is laser spectroscopy. So we wanted to see what happens when the temperature changes uh, by this much, what happens when we change the frequency that we're using for our heating element. The biggest reason to not use an electric heating element is just due to the risk that the heating element itself since you're sending a current through it, can introduce its own magnetic field to the atoms. So we wanted to see what we have to do with the heating element to, to try to keep that issue to a minimum, and then see how well do we have to control the magnetic field, and also what do different polarizations of the interrogating beam, basically either linear or circular polarization, what, what do those do for the spectra? And the way that we analyzed this was basically capturing um, basically sweeping the laser frequency with a piezo transducer on the external cavity of the laser to get a mostly, in time, mostly linear um, change in frequency, and then recording the absorptive readings from the photomultiplier tube on an oscilloscope. Then we could do some fitting with known values for the, basically the center values of the peaks. Um, and, and then, Use some fitting from there to find the full width at half max. We want narrow line widths. If we have a well-defined frequency, then we can, well, we, ha we have a good clock basically. So the narrower the frequency, the better. Uh, we also have locked our laser to atomic resonance. This means that we have our photomultiplier tube watching the resonance of the atoms. And then we can connect that to some electronics that goes back to our laser that can basically control the current um, and a few other things too of the laser, but we're using the current to lock the laser to resonance. If you increase the current of the laser or decrease it, that'll increase or decrease the, the frequency of the laser beam ever so slightly. So you can get a, uh, a, a feedback loop to kind of keep on resonance. It actually looks really cool. Um, Mostly because, like, once you, once you have the laser locked, because you have this vapor cell that's glowing blue, and you know that the only energy you're putting into the vapor cell is in 
the form of near infrared light. So you have this red light, which you know has less energy per photon than what you're seeing um, leave the cell. So it's, it's, it's it was pretty cool. I wanted to share a photo. I really wanted to share a photo. Um, unfortunately, it was just too hard to get a good one because we had to keep the lab dark uh, doing this. Uh, the next things that we All right, thank you. Um, the next things that we are going to do with this, basically, there, there's there's two more paths that we're, we're going to take both of these with this project is we want to measure the relative instabilities. Um, the reason I'm saying that it's hard to directly measure the instability of a clock or a frequency standard once you've locked it, because it's so precise, we don't have anything else in our lab that is that precise. You, you can't, you have to, you can't measure the, uh, the small ruler with the large ruler. So what, what, do we, what do we do to make up for this? We do have a second vapor cell, uh, second slightly different scheme for keeping, for protecting the cell from magnetic fields and for keeping the cell hot. We're going to keep our laser locked where it is um, in our vapor cell. Currently this is locked to the F2 to F4 transition. And then we're going to take that beam that is stabilized to the atomic transition, and we're going to increase the frequency um, on the order of megahertz with something called an acousto-optic modulator. Basically, that takes the laser beam in and puts out a beam with a slightly increased, well, a well-controlled increased frequency. And we're going to stabilize that frequency difference to the F3 to F5 transition in rubidium-85. We will be able to record the frequency change that we're putting on the laser beam with our modulator. So if we can record the frequency change, we can record the relative instabilities of these, these two transitions. Both of them are pretty preferable for making a clock. And then we can get an idea of how accurate our clock is. Uh, the other thing we want to do is so far we've been talking about what, is, what does this laser beam do to the atoms, but of course, the, the atoms do something to the laser beam in return. They, uh, they actually apply a phase shift to the laser beam, we think. Um, this is very commonly studied with one photon spectroscopy, where you basically have a change in refractive index near the atomic resonance. Because if the atoms resonate, they can put a phase shift on the laser beam because they're resonating at the same frequency. Um, we want to see if this is the case with the two photon resonance uh, as well. And then depending on if we find a phase shift or not, we'll study how that works. And depending on how that works, we'll figure out what to do with it next. So River, uh, we have three minutes to the next. Perfect timing, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for, um, yeah, the, the reminder and for listening to my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, Love to. Great. Uh, for simplicity, please unmute. Uh, uh, you know, and ask a question just for timing and whatnot. I think that's easiest. Looks like Demos has got a question. I got one question. I may have missed it. Uh, first of all, great talk, River. Really liked it. I may have missed it, Thank but you. what stability are you shooting for on the oscillator, or are you just are you just testing out a concept? Right, so we we want to stabilize the laser beam to the atomic resonance. So basically that means that the frequency of the laser beam times Planck's constant, so the, the photon energy is half of the energy difference between the ground state and the excited state. So between the F2 state and the F4 state. Um, oh, I, actually, I, I, I guess I was not asked my question poorly. So let me, so you're, you're trying to make an oscillator a clock, right? And yes. oscillator stabilities are measured in, you know, like one part per million or one part per billion. So we're, we're know, hoping, kind of... we're hoping for 14 to 15 digits. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's so right. Thank you. Fantastic. Excellent talk. Fantastic.
River. Excellent talk. Um, maybe I'll ask you to uh, stop sharing screen and ask our next speaker to start sharing screen.